This is us arriving to Ooh Ah Point during a whiteout snowstorm. Oh, How in the world did we end up here? Well, because I'm not a professional influencer or anything cool like that, I typically work at a glamping resort over the summer. It's the kind of place where wealthy people from the land of right angles come to experience a taste of the real, warm, cute, actual world. Oh. And while said tourists are enjoying their Buddha bowls and glasses of wine, I'm the guy cleaning the toilets and mopping the floors. I'm the man carrying their luggage and helping teach these adults how to make fire and removing creepy crawling bugs from their tents. Now, if I sound like I'm complaining about my job, you've got me wrong. Sure, I feel underpaid for what I do. Yet, the real joy is in being this stepping stone for people who spend their lives in front of computer screens with a mouse in their hand. I get to act as a sort of a guide, showing these folks a window back into the world they've lost touch of. Beyond restoking the tribal roots of modern travelers, I also like to try my best to ensure that anyone who comes to work a season at the Grand Canyon actually takes time to experience the Grand Canyon. See, when you do seasonal work in a very remote place, these companies are almost always understaffed because it's hard to find modern day humanoids that will agree to live in the middle of nowhere with no Wi-Fi. And because the companies are understaffed, a large majority of the employees that sign up to work a summer at the Grand Canyon are asked to work more and more hours. And then they don't even step foot on a Grand Canyon trail. I've even met people that moved here without a car and didn't even see the Grand Canyon the whole summer. This is my buddy Gumbel. He traveled from Mongolia to work at the canyon. And when I learned that after a few months of being here, that he hadn't even seen the Grand Canyon. Yes, the people that clean your bed sheets and fluff your pillows, if they don't have a car, they might not ever see the Grand freaking Canyon, even while working a whole season here. So when I learned this, I told Gumbel to hop in my car, we're going to the edge, and this was his reaction walking up to Mather Point. We're following. <laughs> we're following what, Laura, what did man. they tell you about Grand Canyon? Oh, it's exciting and all that. Sure. Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. To, it's exciting, to. sure. You know? But we're going to see. We're going to see what those people said. All those people hyped it up. They hyped it up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Crazy. Wonderful. You know. Suddenly, it occurred to me that Gumbold was translating his reaction to seeing the Grand Canyon for the first time. And I realized if I wanted to truly sense his energy, I had to just let him speak in his native tongue. Yo, it's... <laughs> Last September, I learned that another one of my co-workers, Jonah, had yet to do a Grand Canyon hike. We both agreed that on the next day we both had off of work, we would hike to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and back up in a day. Something I am not at all recommending you do, yet it's a lot of fun if you're prepared and physically fit. So guess what happened? On the next day, Jonah and I both had off from work. October 12th, 2021, and I would say our first significant snow. 
Supplies are delivered to the workers at the bottom of the Grand Canyon every day by mule. It's one of the last places in the U.S. that still delivers mail by mule. Days like this, you can't see the bottom. Because the air is warmer down there, snow is evaporating and turning to fog. Blue bus, shuttle stop. When's the last time you waited at a shuttle in the snow? Yeah? I used to have to ride a shuttle bus into work. In Colorado? Yeah. Damn. Yeah, I worked at Bell. I didn't know much about Jonah before this hike because we worked in different departments at the Clamping Resort. If he had called me up that morning and told me he didn't feel comfortable doing his first Grand Canyon hike in a snowstorm, I probably would have agreed that it wasn't such a great idea. Yet, Jonah was excited for this hike, and there was no telling the next time we both would have the same days off of work. Thank you, you too. Yo, you ready? It's go time for the sun. <laughs> yeah, it's a blizzard. All right, so if you, there's restrooms here. We'll have restrooms in about a mile and a half. Um, let's go, man. 8.07 a.m. We're starting on the trail. I got Jonah. First time hiking the canyon. First time ever. I love it, man. You're going, <laughs> you're starting with an epic hike today. It was gonna be wild. It wasn't what I thought, but we're going down there. We'll be back up. Yeah. It's gonna be like 80 degrees. There's gonna be sandy beaches. Oh yeah. There's gonna be beer. Oh yeah. All kinds of women, beer, sun. Yeah. yeah. So here we are, South Kaibab Trail. And we're gonna get moving so we can stay warm because I'm wearing freaking shorts. And uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful October day. I had decided to take Jonah on my favorite Grand Canyon hike. You drop down to the bottom of the canyon by way of the South Kaibab Trail. You cross the river and head to Phantom Ranch for some food and drink. And then you climb a vertical mile back up to the top of the canyon by way of the Bright Angel Trail. The hike in total is about 18 miles, or 29 kilometers. On average, it takes me about 12 hours to do this hike. My fastest time was around seven and a half hours. Oh, we're breaking trail, man. Almost immediately after stepping on the trail, we encountered a man. And then a few more hikers. They were asking how close they were to the top. Usually you could see that the top is right there. But in this weather, they had no idea how close they were to completing a rim-to-rim -rim hike. All right, you just made it out rim-to-rim. Yes. In the snowstorm. Exhausted, tired, sleeping at any random place. This is my friend. There are four more of us. We made it. <laughs> oh, the, yeah. They're on their way. All the best, guys. Yes. Awesome, thank you. Look how steep it is. Wow. This trail is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once we reached Ua Point, the winds were blowing out of control. I had never experienced this in all of my years hiking Grand Canyon. Suddenly I realized this was the most dangerous Grand Canyon hike I'd ever attempted. So 
Jonah, where are you from? I'm from Maine. Now, we planned this hike like a week ago. Uh -huh. I feel like the canyon is giving you a gift. Yeah, I think there's something going on here. But, uh, it's alright. We're ready for it. Oh, you're ready for it. I'm slipping and sliding, man. I got ice skulls on my face. Hold on, Joe. We're all full down here at Cedar Ridge. There's been another death at Grand Canyon National Park. New at 10, another person has fallen to their death at the Grand Canyon. There were two deaths this week at the Grand Canyon. One man accidentally went over the edge while taking a selfie. Helicopter spotted the body about 400 feet below the rim, but because of the very dangerous terrain and darkness, recovery efforts were suspended last night. In Arizona, our news ain't exactly like your news, is it? It's a miracle I haven't died already. The fact that I'm alive tells me there's got to be some reason. God has given me so many chances. So many chances to get it right. We've got to get it right, people. We've got to get it right. We've got to get it right. A woman trying to take pictures during her vacation to the Grand Canyon fell to her death. A fiery crash in the Grand Canyon has now left a fourth person dead. A family is in mourning tonight after a 23-year-old Phoenix man fell and died while hiking the Grand Canyon. The number one selling Grand Canyon book is titled Over the Edge, Death in the Grand Canyon. I know you city folks. You right angle folks, you sprinklers in every room, CO2, smoke detection kind of folks. Well, you guys are clearly intrigued by the riskiness of nature. You folks are captivated by the Grand Canyon's ongoing ability to take human life. The book is divided into chapters like Falls from the Rims, Falls Within the Canyon, Environmental Deaths, Flash Flood, the Killer Colorado, Death from the Air, Freak Errors and Accidents, Critters and Cacti, Suicide, and even Murder. But I bet you never considered how many people die each year of hypothermia from mere exposure to cold weather in the Grand Canyon. Onwards. Nearly 17 miles remaining, and we could hardly walk a straight line. At the Cedar Ridge pit toilets, I took a moment to put wool thermals over top of my shorts. I'm ready, man. <laughs> Dude, we are a mile and a half into an 18 mile hike. <laughs> this is... We should finally get going. <laughs> I got some mother thermals on. It's gonna be better. 9 a.m., 9.01, we're leaving Cedar Ridge. Once we reached the supai layer of the Grand Canyon, Jonah and I had broken through the storm, and we were now at an elevation where the air temperature was above freezing. 
Mule riders who had spent the night at Phantom Ranch were passing us on their way back up to civilization, and we were suddenly in the Redwall Limestone layer, beyond Skeleton Point. We were in the Bright Angel Shale, at tip-off. As the pack mules carrying outgoing mail and garbage from Phantom Ranch passed us, I told Jonah my wine analogy. Basically the concept is that um, these layers built up on top of one another, right? So it's the fact that the canyon was carved, that's what reveals all this to us. Because, you know, other, other parts of the world, this is below your feet. But like if you live in like New Jersey or New York City, you start digging a hole and you just hit water. So you can't get to see it. But here it's like this land lifted up and then it carved out. So you get to see all these layers that are normally like buried under so far. But I, I like to think about it. I think I was telling you that the one night I like to think of it like wine where <laughs> it's like it, it locked away this era. All these eras are locked away piece by piece. Every year, grapes are grown. And all the energy of that summer, the sunlight, the temperature, the oxygen, that all gets locked away into the grapes, which are then transformed into wine. These bottles of wine can be uncorked at any time in the future, allowing us to have a taste of one of our favorite summers all over again. The Grand Canyon is kind of like that. See, all of these different layers of rock were once alive. So yeah, right, like even this right here, looking at these worm fossils right there, right? That's locked away. Like that's an era of time that, think of it today as like in a forest, those leaves are falling to the ground, you know, uh, animals are pooping, and it's creating that sediment that gets buried enough, it just solidifies into stone and it's, it's locked away. But here you also see it come back to life because as this rock breaks, right, it almost becomes dirt again. So it's like it's getting a second life. The Grand Canyon is one of the greatest places on earth to study life and death. The theme here is contrast. From the snow-covered subalpine forests at the top of the canyon, to this 440 foot long bridge crossing an 80 foot deep river in a Sonoran desert climate. So you can imagine too, like things like this, you know, it was occupied for a long time. I forget what they say on here. What's fun to think about is like, you know, these are uh, ruins that are on the North Rim, but I almost think of it like its own city in the sense of like picturing like skyscrapers with balconies, like, you know, there, there's ruins in here and there and at the bottom and like these people just like living all over the place. Thousands of people have lived and died in this canyon. Thousands of stories of action, adventure, romance, and heartbreak lost to time. Like snowflakes melting on a rock and making their way down to the river. So we're down here at Phantom Ranch. We got snow. We can see up there, right? Do you have any advice for <laughs> hikers that have never even uh, hiked Grand Canyon before? You definitely 
definitely want to dedicate a lot of your training to elevation gain because if you're not used to elevation gain, even if you've got the miles in, without that elevation gain training, it's just not, it's not going to work out. <laughs> you're going to be huffing and puffing. Um, make sure you got the right shoes. I didn't. You don't like those? Um, they're good now, but when we were hiking oh, in the snow this morning, yeah, no protection whatsoever. So yeah, tell me about that. You guys started on the North Rim. Yeah, we which, started. Which is uh, 9,000, I feel like... The top of North Kaibab's like around 8,000, 9,000? Yeah, something like that. But we woke up and it was just a wall of just snow blowing in your face. Thankfully, I had like a face mask to protect my face. That's exactly what I did too. Yeah, because yeah, we had to have it on the shuttle bus. So I just kept it on. Yeah. Um, this is my friend Jonah. But yeah, it wasn't until like we were almost at the very bottom. I was like, oh. I still have my face mask on my chin. <laughs> like, yeah, but if you're not prepared for snow, it's just not a good idea to have the wrong shoes on. <laughs> and how, how far in advance do you guys plan this? We planned this all the way back in June. So, so you had no idea, like yeah, there was no way to idea. know. I mean, it we was gonna... looked at the weather and it was changing so sporadically. So it was like, oh, it might snow, it might not. So I'm like, okay, I'll just get my shoes. And then they didn't have the gaiters, so these shoes come with Velcro. Ooh, yeah. On the back. That would be really helpful. So you oh, can man. buy like gaiters and attach them to the shoes. But that would have helped a lot, it right? <laughs> I I dealt with the same thing. I like wearing running shoes. Uh, Jonah's got some nice waterproof shoes. Um, what do you think about those? Yeah, they've been they're waterproof or water resistant they worked really well my feet are dry yeah. nice so, yeah it's been good i guess a uh, happy medium is bring extra socks right that's what i did yeah i just changed my socks down here People at the top of a canyon are in a whole different world than we are at the bottom. Midday at Phantom Ranch, we got to enjoy a touch of sunshine and 60 degree weather. We got to enjoy the final moments of green grass and leaves on the trees before the annual cold, harsh winter falls upon Northern Arizona. See, Northern Arizona ain't exactly like Southern Arizona. The town of Flagstaff, located just 57 miles south of the Grand Canyon, averages 100 inches of snow each winter. That's more than double the snowfall of New York City. That's more than double the snowfall of Chicago. In November 2019, a few weeks before the first human contracted COVID-19, we experienced a snowstorm that dumped 15 inches of snow in less than 12 hours. Hotels lost power. Tourists traveling without shovels struggled to dig their cars out of their parking spaces. Mule rides were canceled for the day, and the riders who had spent the night at the bottom couldn't get back up. Even the train that comes to the Grand Canyon once a day, before turning around, got stuck in the snow on its way back to civilization. The National Park began setting up an emergency shelter 
heated by backup generators. But fortunately, power was restored to the hotels inside Grand Canyon Village just before nightfall. As Jonah and I began our ascent back to the snow world at the top of the canyon, rain dumped on us. And then sunlight. And then something totally unexpected. Jonah and I experienced a close encounter with one of the rarest birds in the world. That's a condor. <laughs> the California condor. Dude. <laughs> he is huge. He's coming in to see you, man. See the tag on his wing? Uh, they, they number them because there's only about 600 known in the world. Critically endangered species. In the early 1980s, the number of California condors plummeted after decades of poaching and environmental hazards like pollution, habitat loss, and lead poisoning. Just 22 birds remained. The California condor, the largest bird in North America, is making a comeback from the brink of extinction. Conservationists scrambled to protect them with breeding programs at zoos in Los Angeles and San Diego to keep them wild in captivity and to keep them from growing attached to humans, scientists use puppets to raise the condor chicks. With a nine and a half foot wingspan, it is the largest bird in North America, yet few have ever seen one. Yo, it's... <laughs> See it? Not even a flap this whole time. Oh, there you go. Oh, he's going to land. Oh, he's going to land. Are you see what he's doing? So he probably just fed. Because when they do that, they're using the sun to disinfect their wings. The condor extended its wings outwards. Something I learned from a park ranger that condors do just after feeding. See, their feathers are covered with all kinds of rotting flesh after they feed on a carcass. This scavenger bird must have just fed on some big dead animal. See, the birds know the healing powers of sunlight. Sunlight disinfects things. This is why I kept my COVID mask in my dashboard for the past couple years. And just like that, the condor is extending its wings, allowing the sunlight to hit any little bits of rotting flesh that might be on its feathers so that it is disinfected. This condor was probably feeding on some large animal like an elk or a deer or a bighorn sheep that possibly died from falling off a cliff during a freak October snowstorm. We humans only get such a short blip of time to spend in this world. Yet, we see the traces of millions of species that died long before our time. The condor survival story is an example of what I think our role is in this world. We humans, with our knowledge and abilities, can save a dying species. We can plant trees. We can pick up garbage which is, in a sense, the niche of the condor in this world. I've got like five, because we're in a snowstorm, I've got like five layers on. So, and yeah. I've got plastic bags in my shoes. 
Yeah. Really? Two oh, our shoes were shoes were sopped. Shoes two were pairs sopping of wool socks. What? <laughs> I got it. Shoes it. were sopping wet. Oh my god. And two pairs of socks and some long johns. Whoa. Show them that picture, but kids, when I we started. Be over prepared be rather than under prepared. So the oh this morning. Show them this morning. Yeah. So I'm looking at it back behind you. I can see the snow. Oh yeah. On the oh, north rim. And the wind's blowing. That's what is great about it. The wind was just ripping. It's what? It's 5 p.m. So we've been hiking 10 hours. But tell him why we've been hiking 10 I saw hours. It. She, she <laughs> farted and she's like dragging me for a while. I hurt my back. I slipped or something. And, Ooh. and uh, what did you have? What did this you This is me? this morning when we took off. No. So it was a blizzard. Show him the picture of the hook. Oh, show him the trail oh. where we just started. Yeah, look at those, look at those smiles though. You guys still have That's them. You still of, have them. Those are the smells of stupidity. This is what happens after 30 years of marriage. I just yeah. follow her around. She's a machine. She's taking me everywhere. We Patagonia. We we hit it big. Happy wife. Happy you guys wife. are crushing it. Place that my dad taught me when I was young. You got to keep moving. Hey, emergency phone. Yeah, we've. Um, there's a mom and, and daughter. Dad. Suddenly, we all got involved in helping a hiker in distress. Something I didn't film at all. And then, after that, it was time for Jonah and I to push our way back to the top of the canyon. In the end, it doesn't really matter where you hiked. It doesn't matter how fast your time was. What lives with me and haunts me and brings tears to my cheeks is knowing that we can never fully recreate these experiences. What matters the most is the people we hiked with and the people we met along the trail and the way we all made each other feel. Yo, it's... <laughs> we made it! And the way we all felt like we were a part of something, if only for a day. I've come to realize I might not ever get to be some rich or famous influencer. I might just be some dude cleaning toilets the rest of my life. But at least I had the chance to affect a few people's lives. People might watch a video like this and think I'm being totally reckless hiking in a snowstorm. Yet, the truth is, I always aim to be the guy who is so overly prepared, he can save a life. I get to live with the humble joy of knowing I was in the right place at the right time. In these years at Grand Canyon, I was able to save about four people who might have very well died out there on the trails, some of which never even caught my name. I can hardly begin to express the gratitude I have to all the friends I've made throughout my years at Grand Canyon. Some of us sharing experiences that I'll revisit for a lifetime. Thank you to all of us who made a choice to escape the overly civilized world of right angles and spent a little more time out here in the wild, allowing ourselves to be humbled by nature. Did it, dog? Hell yeah. You just topped out of the Grand Canyon. What do you want to do now? Probably go do it again. <laughs> Let's go. Second lap. Yeah, it definitely won't be the last time. Thank you. <laughs>